All right, we are here today uh, with Pastor George Lawson again uh, from Baltimore Bible Church and Omri Miles from uh, Grace Bible Church. It is Grace Bible Church, right, Omri? Yeah. Uh, in the Phoenix area. So grateful to have you brothers back here. Thank you very much for your time. Um, greatly, greatly appreciate you carving some time out of your busy schedules. Uh, before we get into uh, have another chat today, about the issues we've been facing. Just a, a brief introduction um, from both of you. George, we'll let you go first, just in case anyone missed you from our last discussion. Yeah, sure. So uh, name's George Lawson. Uh, grew up in upstate New York, Albany, New York. Uh, graduated of the Master's Seminary. Been pastoring here in Baltimore for the last seven years. Uh, Baltimore Bible Church is a church plant out of uh, Grace Advance from uh, Grace Community Church and um, Hope Bible Church, which is a local church here in Columbia, Maryland. I've been married for 22 years, have three kids, uh, Carice, Micah, and Cara, 21, 19, and 17. So uh, uh, definitely uh, uh, a lot going on in the, in the house here, and uh, you can pray for, for grace, but uh, we've uh, really appreciated the, uh, the opportunity to uh, spend additional time with our family uh, this, uh, during the season. But, uh, but yeah, God is good. Amen. Thank you, George. Thank you, George. Omri. Yeah, my name is Omri Miles. I am a pastoral intern here at Grace Bible Church in Tempe, Arizona. I've been uh, in Tempe or in, in the Phoenix area for 12 years now and uh, originally grew up, was born and raised in New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, spent a few years in Georgia in school before moving out here. Uh, I'm married to my wife, Emily. Uh, we've been married for eight years. We have four children, uh, Chloe, who is six, Obadiah is four and a half, Jonah, two, Ezekiel is one. So uh, we're on the opposite end from you, George. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, you got a wonderful family. Uh, grateful for both of you guys. And Omri, a little known secret is, maybe not the secret is, uh, has some giftedness with uh, hip hop. I've benefited from some of the work you've done with the shy and uh, is it lamp mode? Did you do some work with lamp mode maybe at one time? Uh, nope, not not as an official label. Wrath and Grace is uh Wrath and Grace is the right. label that I that I've been working with. Yeah, yeah, good stuff. All right, gentlemen. So uh, I wanted to continue our discussion, George. Again, thank you very much uh, for our discussion uh, last week about the racial issues. So helpful. I wanted to sort of build on that and ask you gentlemen about uh, the Black Lives Matter organization. They've obviously been uh, very much in the news lately uh, with the tragic death of George Floyd. Um, and definitely uh, their rally cry has been heard around the country um, as they've been building over the last uh, few years or so. So to begin with, um, I'll, I'll ask you, George, what is the difference uh, for, for those of us who might not be aware, talk about the difference between the fact and the idea that Black Lives Matter and the organization, this official movement, mm -hmm. the Black Lives Matter organization that was founded, I think, in 2013. Yeah, so um, I would say that, you know, the phrase by itself isn't necessarily problematic. Um, and uh, and, and I'll, I'll talk about that a, a little bit. I mean, first of all, as, as Christians, we know that, that all life matters. Uh, but uh, we don't just state that all life matters. We actually can go back and explain why and defend why all life matters. And as uh, Christians, we understand that uh, life matters because we've been made in the in image of God. Uh, you know, Genesis 1, 26 and 27, that God created man in his own image, in the image of God. He created him, male and female. He created them. So we, we understand that we're made in the image of God. And that's what gives our life uh, value. Uh, Malachi chapter 2, uh, verse 10, and I'll, I'll read this one. Uh, do we not all have one father? Has not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously each against his brother so as to profane the covenant of our fathers? And uh, life matters so much, you know, that we've been made in the image of God matters so much that in Genesis chapter 9 and, and verse 6, it lets us know that if you shed man's blood, by man shall your blood be shed, that the image of God, and, and the, the reason why it goes on to explain it's because we've been made in the image of God. That's why our life matters. That's why life has value. Mm. Uh, so we can connect it as Christians back to being in the Imago Dei. We're in the image of God. So, um, so it's stating up front that Black Lives Matter is not problematic in itself. 
and uh, I've explained to people even uh, some of the reasons uh, why, you know, some people would say, well, we need to make, make a point of kind of separating black lives, you know, matters from other lives, you know, uh, matters or whatever they, they might want to say, you know, and some people would be offended in that movement. You know, if you say, well, all lives matter, it's like, well, that's not the point. Um, and I'll, I'll just use this illustration that I, for some people they found helpful uh, that, that let's say American citizens were being historically, um, consistently, habitually mistreated in another country. You know, so let's say American citizens in you know Middle Eastern country were habitually being mistreated in, in a particular country or say we went to, to Canada, habitually being mistreated in Canada. And uh, you've heard stories about it. You've seen videos about it. You've heard uh, personal stories about being mistreated when people go to Canada. And then a video comes out with uh, a Canadian officer with his neck, with, with his uh, knee on the neck of an American citizen and, you know, crushes him to like, uh, to death. Like America at that point might be ready to go to war. You know, like American citizens would just be outraged, you know, like, like what in the world is going on? And you could see the, just the outcry, the outrage over that happening because of the, the history uh, that's behind it. They might not even know all the details, but just that image in itself, you know, Canadian officer crushing the, the life out of a, an American citizen, you know, Americans would be outraged. And if we said, you know, hey, you know, Canada, American lives matter. And they responded, well, hey, all lives matter. What's the, what's the big deal? All lives matter. It's like, well, that's not really the point that we're trying to make. Or if they said, you know, well, American citizens kill each other more than Canadians kill Americans. So, you know, what's, what's the big deal? Like, you're not getting the point. Uh, so, so again, like you crushing this American citizen and, uh, and snuffing his life out, it's like an attack against him. It's like an attack against all of us in that sense. So some people from the Black Lives Matter would say that, well, the reason why we, we need to kind of put that to the forefront is because, um, because, you know, historically and habitually, you know, blacks have been mistreated in this country. And that's why we need to kind of put that out, that black lives, lives matter. So as far as just stating it up front and, 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 and again, I, I think that it can be divisive, even, you know, using black lives instead of just making it a human rights issue, you know, to say it's, you know, just a black issue because, you know, it doesn't acknowledge that there's tragedies that happen, you know, with other ethnicities as well. But let's kind of set that aside. Just saying that, that a person's life matters, that there's no problem with that. But when you, when you start talking about the, the Black Lives Matter movement and joining a movement, what you have to understand is that movement comes with a set of beliefs uh, that could actually be likened to a religion. I mean, they have a doctrinal statement. They have a set of beliefs. Actually, I, I'd argue that they have a, a, a more robust doctrinal statement than many churches in America. You know, they have more to say about what they believe than many churches in America. It's, it's really a set of beliefs. And, uh, and we can talk about this later, but it's a set of beliefs that argues against the family, argues against government. And, and I would also argue that the, the last man standing, the last you know, kind of uh, pillar that they need to knock down to make their movement work is they need to get rid of the church. And, uh, and we can talk about that later. But, um, but as, a, as a movement, it comes with a, a set of beliefs uh, that are really anti-biblical. Um, so you can't just stand with people in this movement to say that we agree with life, we agree that life is valuable, we agree that, that life should be protected, because that's not all that they're about. And uh, when you really go into the history, they're, they're about much more uh, than just, you know, wanting to see uh, the, the human rights uh, being protected. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, George. Very helpful. Yeah. Omri, uh, if I could ask you, so, and George brought up a, a, a huge point that this is, this is an organization um, that has doctrine and has beliefs. Yeah. Can you talk yeah. about uh, those beliefs and, and how they square up um, with biblical truth. Sure. I was uh, just, you know, to quote from, uh, from their website um, a little bit. And, and this is, yeah, it's, it's incredible. I mean, you, you look at the website, there's a what we believe section, probably like all of our churches, right? What we believe. Mm -hmm. uh, and so some of their, the things that they believe, I'll just read. We, we make space for transgender brothers and sisters to participate and lead. Um, we are self-reflexive reflexive and do the work required to dismantle 
cisgender privilege and uplift black trans folk, especially black trans women who continue to be disproportionately impacted by trans antagonistic violence. Uh, we build a space that affirms Black women and is free from sexism, misogyny, and environments in which men are centered. Uh, we make our spaces family-friendly and enable parents to fully participate with their children. We dismantle the patriarchal practice that requires mothers to work double shifts so that they can mother in private, even as they participate in public justice work. Um, we disrupt the Western prescribed nuclear family structure requirement by supporting each other as extended families and quote unquote villages that collectively care for one another, especially our children, to the degree that mothers, parents, and children are comfortable. So, I mean, this organization clearly is anti Christ, it's anti biblical. The very things that they stand for. Uh, and there's there's more. That's just a very small portion of the what we believe page on the website. But these things are anti-Christ. Uh, they're ungodly. They actually work against God's very created order. Um, so this this goes back to what George read in in Genesis one. Um, this seeks to thwart that very purpose. And so no Christian. Uh, should seek to align themselves with with this organization and i'll just add to that uh just just really quick like when, when you think about um you know the uh the institutions that god has ordained and given authority you know on the earth right. you know so you think about about family you know the first family is established by god the first nuclear family is established by god so so this is god's design the nuclear family husband wife children that is God's design. And when you say that, that you're, you're trying to dismantle the Western and, you know, they, they say it's Western instead of just, you know, this is what God yeah. has set up. It's this Western idea. We're, we're here to dismantle the Western idea of the, the nuclear family. Who are you attacking in that? Who are you saying doesn't have wisdom at that point? You're, 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 you're denying the wisdom of God and you're elevating your own wisdom above God. This is an attack against God. It's God's idea. The, the family is God's idea. Uh, the, one of the other things that, that they're making this big push for now, you know, so you think about, you know, uh, God has ordained family. God's also ordained government, right? God's ordained government. You know, uh, right. Romans chapter 13, people are to be subject to the governing authorities. You know, First Peter chapter 2, you know, speaks about submitting to every human institution for the Lord's sake. Submit to every human institution for the Lord's sake, whether to a king as one in authority or to governors as sent by him. So, so government, again, given authority by God. It's the, for the Lord's sake that we submit ourselves to human institutions. One of the big pushes that black, the Black Lives Matter movement is making right now is to defund the police. We, we, we don't want police there. It's not just like we want to change the, the structure. We want better police in there. Yeah. No, they want to get rid of the police yeah. altogether. We, we want no police in our communities. That is what they're arguing for and what they're trying to get petitions signed for. And if you're following some of the news in, in Minnesota, that's something that's a, a, a real discussion uh, right now to get rid of the police department. There was a time when uh, there was a nation that didn't have uh, police and authority and a king in charge. And, and, and anybody ever read of a book like that in the Bible? The book, of, the, the book of Judges, where every man did, there was no king, and every man did what was right in his own eyes. Read through the book of Judges and see how that worked out when they didn't have yeah, any yeah. authority over them. I mean, you have, you have uh, 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 homosexual mobs that are gathered together to, to try to rape a man who's a traveling, traveling through uh, uh, Israel. Uh, you have him you know, pushing his concubine out, which is a problem in itself, pushing his concubine out so that they can rape her all through the night and leave her dead body on the doorstep. I mean, that's the kind of thing. And he butchers her up and sends her out, you know, her body parts out to the rest of Israel. Like, take a good look at that. That is what it looks like when there is no authority structure. When, when, when you remove authority, you remove any kind of uh, constraints, and you just let the society run wild, that is what you're asking for. And, and wow. think about this, community policing, right? You know, they say, oh, we just want community policing. Isn't that why we got into this problem in the first place? That a guy by the name of George Zimmerman was doing community policing? and shot Trayvon Martin. I mean, that's one of the reasons why the, the Black Lives Matter organization started in the first place. 
It was this community policing. And uh, with Ahmad yeah. Arbery, what happened there? Community policing. But now you're saying, well, that's what we want. We want to, com we want to police ourselves, get rid of the authorities, get rid of any structure. Like who now determines who has a gun, who, who, who has the authority to arrest? I mean, like it's just a mess waiting to, to happen. I mean, this is like a, a powder keg, you know, ready to explode if people follow down this train. So you, yeah. you, you get rid of family, get rid of government. What's the third thing to go? The church. And the church is the only institution that would, that would have to stand against this movement. Uh, unfortunately, many churches I've seen, you know, are posting Black Lives Matter on their page and, you know, their pages are turning to black to show this solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement and actually posting, you know, uh, saying, stating the Black Lives Matter logo and things like that. That the church has been given the authority of the truth. Uh, we're, we're the pillar and support of the truth. First uh, Timothy uh, 3.15 uh, lets us know that. And from the statement that you just read, the, this uh, statement about, you know, dismantling the family and uh, dismantling authority structures and, uh, you know, promoting this kind of uh, transgender agenda, that the church is unable to cave into the true church. Mm -hmm. You know, not, not the, 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 the ones that just have church hanging outside of their, their building, but the true church is unable to cave into that message. It's unable to support that movement. Uh, so um, it's... The, like Lord, Lord help us, and Lord help the true churches right. uh, that they would think critically, theologically, biblically, you know, through all these issues, uh, because this is this is not a movement that the church is able to get behind. We 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 just can't. Wow. One of the things you'll notice about the uh, the Black Lives Matter movement is how much power is mentioned on the website. <clears throat> um, I've I've said this in the past and and even more recently, but that the movement is actually not about equality and racial reconciliation um they it, it's actually a power trip uh and in any time you have a group of people who are called by god to submit to an authority structure and that group of people who's supposed to be in submission tell those who are in authority what they must do to earn their submission you've got anarchy uh, mm -hmm. or an anarchist bent on your hand, right? No justice, no peace. Um, any parent with any sense at all would put that kind of uprising in their own homes down very quickly, right? If your kids said, hey, no justice, no peace, you must give in to my demands or else I'm going to give you problems. You'd be looking like, what? Who do you think you are? <laughs> You can't live here with that attitude, right? Hmm. Um, you got to get in line. And so the, it, it's not um, the premise of the movement uh, is one that's calling for power, not a legitimate God-ordained power, but it's an overthrow. You'll, you'll see it on the website, the term dismantling, deconstruction. They're seeking to deconstruct, dismantle God-ordained authorities in order to establish their own and no christian can get can get behind that um there's an issue of of uh christians wanting to stand in solidarity right uh christians are compassionate and merciful charitable loving people and when there's a a grievance right godly people when there's weeping godly people want to go weep with them right mm -hmm. godly right. people want to show compassion um i think that at the expense sometimes of discerning the grievances, Christians have actually rushed to show solidarity in, in ways that are actually unhelpful, mm -hmm. right? So, so we hear um, 2 Corinthians 6 often quoted in the context of marriage being unequally yoked. Um, that, that passage may apply, have implications for marriage, but it's not primarily about marriage, right? I'm just going to read that starting in 2 Corinthians 6, 14, do not be bound together with unbelievers for what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness or what fellowship has light with darkness or what harmony has Christ with Belial or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever or what agreement has the temple of God with idols. And then Paul goes on and gives an explanation of that. And actually beginning chapter seven says, therefore having these promises that he just mentioned, Beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and of spirit, 
perfecting holiness and the fear of God. Um, Christians can't be bound together. Just listen to the language Paul uses, bound together in partnership, uh, in fellowship, harmony, uh, have in common, what agreement, right? Those are words that, those are solidarity type words. And mm -hmm. Paul actually forbids that uh, for, for the Christian, for the church to link arms um, in solidarity, solidarity with unbelievers and unbelieving organizations like Black Lives Matter. Um, James 4.4 4 is another pertinent passage. Anyone who is friends with the world makes himself an enemy of God. And frankly, I think that the, the Black Lives Matter movement and what they're pushing for, what, they, what they're calling for in this, uh, you know, over, seeking to overturn systemic injustices toward Black people, it's actually, I think, enticing to some believers who have gotten bored with the Great Commission. Mm -hmm. They said, there are systemic problems in our world, and we need to do something about them, That and the gospel isn't enough. That's mm -hmm. why when you try and say, well, what about preaching the gospel to overturn these issues? People are very upfront, as far as I've seen. Hey, we don't want to hear that. I want to know what you're going to do about it. Don't mm. just pray for me. Don't just preach the gospel. I'm talking about something more than discipleship within the local church and evangelism. And you know what? Lots of things to have gotten us to a point, I think, in evangelicalism where the Black Lives Matter movement is attracted to Christians. Um, part of that, I think, is, and you know, this is probably a, a conversation for another time, but once you do what I think we did, you recover the gospel and then the gospel becomes everything, well, it becomes really nothing at all, right? And you lose the significance and the distinction of the gospel until you end up where we are, where we can't actually distinguish um, gospel actions, uh, what Christ has actually called the church to, um, things that the gospel obligates Christians to and things that the gospel doesn't obligate Christians to do. And so now Christians think that the church is just, uh, you know, what the church does is one thing, but what Black Lives Matter, it does is something separate. And I can pick and choose uh, which one I prefer in a given season or a given moment. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. Uh, just real quick, uh, just to piggyback off of what you said, that uh, the Black Lives Matter is really this, uh, this grab for, for power. You know, it's not really seeking just equality. You know, it's, it's the grab for power. In Leviticus 19 and verse 15, it says, You shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor, nor defer to the great, but you are to judge your neighbor fairly. And uh, a lot of what's uh, uh, being sought after within the movement, you know, empowering people, you know, stripping other people of power, giving power to other people, it's not just seeking seeking justice. It's, it's, it's seeking like some kind of, you know, supremacy, some kind of, you know, uh, uh, for other people to, to bow the knee. And, and, and it, it's been ridiculous to, to see some of the responses that people have had to this. And like, like if, if you really think about this, I mean, with, with the, 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 the statements that they're, they're writing and the, the ways that, that people are responding to this, like, I, I don't know how you can't see that this is like, like an, another religion, like this other form of, and there's no salvation in it. Okay. There's no salvation in it. But basically, it's like like the, the, the posture is every knee must bow and every tongue must confess that black lives matter. And if, if you don't say that statement, even wow. if you want to qualify it, you know, like, well, I, I believe that all life matters. It's like, no, that's not what we want to hear. Mm -hmm. Every knee must yeah. bow and every tongue must confess that black lives matter. And you have these, these pictures of people bowing down, washing oh. people's feet, seeking their forgiveness, you know, for their white privilege and things like that. I don't know how you don't make the connection that, that something yeah. else is going on here. There, there, this is not just yeah. seeking equality. You know, this is seeking something far different. And, and for those who, who do not, you know, bow, like you're part of the problem. Now you're the enemy. If you do yeah. not bow, if you do not confess, you're part of the, the problem. And, and then... Well, even black people, right? George, I mean, even black people who don't buy into the, the Black yeah. Lives Matter agenda, your problem is now that you're too white. Right. right, you've assimilated. You're a part of the problem. You're too white, um, so then you don't even get to be black anymore because you don't 
you don't buy into the agenda. But it's like we, we uh, want to hear all voices except the voices that don't agree with us. You know, we want to give everybody a voice except those that, that do not bow and that do not confess. And here, here's the problem. There is no salvation in it. It's, it's, there's no atonement. Like you never get off this train because how many times must you, yes, yes, I have privilege. Yes, I, I'm sorry for what the ancestors did. Yes. You know, like what, what else, what else needs to happen before it's, it finally reaches a point where, you know, sins are forgiven, you're cleansed, you know, now, now you can enter into the promised land. There is no promised land never, at the end of this people. Never. There is no promised That's land. Right. There is no forgiveness. There is no heaven. It's just this continual penance over and over again. Let me whip myself. You know, this is what my ancestors have done. This is what I've done. This is how I participated. And, and somehow if I don't speak up and I don't agree now, now I'm part of the problem. And, and just, just yeah. real quick, I want to read a statement. Uh, it was written by um, uh, Kevin Huang over at uh, um, Twin Cities uh, Bible Church, uh, Twin City Bible Church. Listen to what he says. To be silent is not always to be complicit and guilty. Jesus was silent before his accusers. To be silent is sometimes to mourn. To be silent is sometimes to be wise. To be silent is sometimes to be humble. To be silent is sometimes to be prayerful. To be silent is sometimes to wait on the Lord. To be silent is sometimes to hope. To be silent is sometimes to speak God's word and not the world's agenda. It is far too simplistic to assume that silence is always complicity and guilt. And that's the way that people are, are posturing themselves. Like if you're silent, you're guilty. If, if you don't say Black Lives Matter, you're guilty. And like I said, there, there's, there's no forgiveness. There's no ultimate forgiveness. There's no atonement. There's no salvation, no promised land. There, there's nothing. It's just the continual, continual, continual guilt and beating yourself and, uh, you know, yes, how, how, how sorry I, I am. There's, there's no end to this. As, a, as, a, as one who seeks to, to shepherd a specific local body and not, not the Internet, personally, um, I can tell you my burden these past few weeks has been for the Saints at Grace Bible Church. Um, We've got a, a decently uh, diverse church, um, but we're predominantly white. And my wife is white. Three of my, my children, biological children, um, are half white. And so I, I can tell you, I have a, a, a burden, a concern that what the world is telling people, primarily white people, that they must feel uh, the guilt, the responsibility, the obligation to take specific types of actions. Um, I, I want to unburden the consciences of our people, of my family, that you're actually not not responsible for those things. Mm -hmm. um, and the movement that is calling for you to act in certain ways is what Paul said would come in the last days in 2 Timothy 3. One of the, the, the ways he describes these difficult times, people in these difficult times, especially in the church, is unappeasable. And I can't think of a, a better adjective to describe the woke church, uh, Black Lives Matter movement is unappeasable. Just like you said, George, mm. there's never an end in sight. There is no promised land for these people. Um, even as you express solidarity, there's another thing coming and there's another, there's another requirement. I don't know if you guys saw that the uh, the mayor of Minnesota, Michael Frey, attended this protest, a protest yep. in his city, and expressed heartfelt solidarity through the police departments under the bus completely, and sought to say, "We are so sorry, white America, for what we have done to you. We we hear you. We're with you." Right? Couldn't have been a more heartfelt, sincere expression of solidarity. They didn't want to hear that. Thank you. What we want to know now is, are you, we have a yes or no question for you. They said, are you going to defund the Minnesota Police Department? That's their next demand. At first, it was express solidarity, listen to our grievances, seek reform. Now, defund the police department. They said, we, we just want a yes or no. And he could not answer yes. He said, I'm not for the abolition. I'm sorry, I, I can't be for the abolition entirely of the police department. And they drove him out of there and put him mm -hmm. to shame. And he was forced to leave. They made an aisle for that man out of the protest and chanted him down out of there. That's what this is. They don't want reconciliation. They want power. And you're right, man. There is no salvation. There's no promised land. Get off the train now. Yep. 
and believe what God has said about the sufficiency of his word and the church. If, if the church is doing what Christ has called her to do, discipling people, loving the church, evangelizing the lost, proclaiming the gospel to a lost world, then we have to be okay with whatever results God gets, whatever fruit he designs um, as, a, as the result of our gospel labors. We got to be okay with that and know that a kingdom is coming. Amen. And Lord willing, we can pray, Maranatha, come Lord quickly. Um, and we can pray that this kingdom comes. Amen. Amen. There's there's only Amen. one just kingdom, and that's the one that's to, to come. And uh when Christ comes back, it's it's not to try to fix up the, the empires of the world, it's that all the kingdoms right. of this world will become the, the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever. And I love that passage in uh, Daniel T where you have all the different empires of the world, you know, represented in the statue. And then you have the stone that comes down and crushes those kingdoms to powder. Right. Like mm-hmm. that is the day that we are looking. That's, that's the promised land we're looking for, right? Amen. Like that's the that's end right, that we're looking for as Christians. We know what the end is and we can bring you to that end. If you would trust in the gospel of Jesus Christ, repent of your sins, trust in Jesus Christ. We can take you to the promised land. We know where the promised land is. Okay. But the, the, the kingdoms of this world will be pulverized and ground into powder, just, just pulverized in the presence of Jesus Christ. And those who are longing for that kingdom, praying for that kingdom, are a part of that kingdom, like that's, that's the promised land that we're looking for. And when we'll finally see justice, you know, roll like a mighty river, right? That's, that's the, the, the end that's right, for the right. believer. You got to get off the train. Whatever train you're on now, it's not heading to the right destination. It may be marked promised land, but that's not where it's heading. Amen. That's right. Gentlemen, thank you. Let, let me ask you two quick questions. There's so, there's so much more that could be said. You guys have been so thorough. This has been extremely valuable. So you guys are both, I'm hearing from you that this is a, this is a movement that's more akin to a religion. You talk about there's no salvation in it. It's a graceless system. There's no reconciliation. There's no salvation. There's no promised land. Who or what is the, the absolute in in this system in the black lives matter movement or for those who ascribe to critical race theory and intersectionality or whatever do you understand what i'm saying who makes who's the moral absolute here uh in this system that sets these standards yeah i, I don't know if you could i mean there's it's nothing outside of themselves i mean that's the that's the point there's like they define the rules they define what's right and wrong they define what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. There, there is no external standard that says that, you know, this is what we subscribe to and this is who we follow and, and this is who tells me when I'm right or I'm wrong. It's up to the individual, you know, to determine like what we want. And, and, and the, the, the thing is, is that with, you know, those who are in charge of the, the movement, you know, who are the, the loudest voices of the movement are kind of directing the movement. But, uh, but the thing is, is that, and, and we all know this, they don't speak for everybody. You know, for, for some people, like, hey, if you defund the police, that's enough. And then there's going to be another group that says, no, we, we want more than that. You know, we want reparations, you know, and uh, we want and there's another group that says, no, we want more than that. You know, we actually we actually want the uh, want your house. We, we, we think that, you know, what you have right now actually belongs to us because you got this off of the backs of black slaves and we want what you have. Like there is no like who defines it? Who, who is the person who says that? Like, yes, this is enough. And yes, that's going too far. Like who determines what's right and wrong in the movement other than the person themselves? So, so th- there is no way, there's no way out. There, there, there's no way out of, of the movement. Uh, there's no way to, to like I said, to, to be granted forgiveness. Um, if one individual may grant it, the next individual can take it away. Uh, so so there's, there's, no, there's no consistency. It's not a monolithic movement in that sense uh, right. because it's made up of, individuals who, who have very different opinions of, of what's right, what's wrong, what's acceptable, what's not. Uh, there, there's just, there's the, the, the ultimate is themselves. It's, it's, it's self, it's the, it's the self that's at the top of the, the, the structure. And nothing is more dangerous than when self becomes the absolute, becomes the moral absolute for any movement, whatever it might be. Um, let me ask you guys, we have a few more minutes here. So, okay, so, so you, you said that no Christian can align themselves with the BLM movement um, because of the doctrine and whatnot and their beliefs. How can an individual then, what can they do to, to support um, 
uh, the, 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 the just treatment of individuals, whether it be black or Asian or whoever, how, what, what can we do to promote justice and, and talk about that idea of justice and, and our role in promoting justice? Omri, you want to yeah. go first? Sure. I, I think if, if Christians um, want to really go after the most thorough type of law enforcement reform, uh, go evangelize policemen. Go evangelize judges. Mm -hmm. Go evangelize lawyers. Um, if those people involved in those various systems actually had a change of heart, that would go a lot further than legislative reform. You, you actually wouldn't need the legislation so much if, if individual men and women involved in those arenas were just, were justified and then turned to become just people. You could open up your Bible um, and disciple them from the scriptures on what it means to be just. Uh, you could know that they would be sitting under the weekly ministry of the word, right, uh, from the pulpit to hear how to think about a whole variety of things, right? So I think that that's the way to, to go after the most thorough uh, reform. I don't think that the answer is commissioning a church to reform those systems. I mean, Jesus himself in, in Luke 12 and 13, there are examples of Jesus actually refusing to overturn injustices, which we don't hear a lot about those examples, right? You hear about Jesus feeding the multitudes, but uh, there was a seeming injustice that a guy's inheritance, rightful portion of the inheritance was being taken. And Jesus said, who made me an arbiter among you? Essentially, that's not my job. But let me tell you about human greed, guard from, from greed. Uh, and then in the next chapter, he talks about, uh, he takes the occasion in Luke 13, the first few verses to, to say, hey, Pilate mingled blood with the sacrifices, that's not just. And there's another uh, social tragedy with the power falling on, on these people. And Jesus takes the occasion not to, to right those wrongs, right? Or bring about justice in those, in those ways. He says, listen, you need to be about repentance. That's more urgent. And so I think going after a thorough change involves that. Um, beyond that, vote well right? This is, this is an area I even need sharpening to actually know what the issues are and know who is up for election or re-election and what their policies have been. And then we can vote well. Um, and I think most importantly, within the church, make sure that justice is done. Practice biblical church discipline from, you know, not just putting people out of the body, excommunication, uh, who refuse to repent, but go to your brother who you're tempted to be bitter toward. Uh, that's what Paul's point is in First Corinthians five, right? To it's not about the church's mission is not establishing justice out in the world and making sure that the state is Christianized or that unbelievers act like Christians, uh, but the, the church is actually called to establish justice in her midst, and by doing that, to stand as a light and as salt before a watching world, so that we look different, we taste different. Um, if the church was doing that, Jesus even says, by this, all men will know that you're my disciple. So I don't think that it's a cop out to say, if you want to see justice accomplished in the world, be more church centered, labor with the church to accomplish the great commission and disciple people. That's not a cop out. Um, and it's not the long way around to the, uh, to a much needed solution in our society. I think it's the short path. I think if more churches were doing that, then we would see uh, some of the problems look different. People would be saying about the American 21st century church, what they were saying about the Jerusalem church and about the first century church, they've turned the world upside down and we could praise God for that. Amen. Amen. Yeah, I'll just add to that real quick that um, uh, it's been said that we, we live in a sin saturated society because sinners saturate it. I mean, there, there's, there, there's sinners that are in these positions of, of power. Uh, it's not like we don't have laws that, uh, uh, that would tell people to do right and, 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 um, and not wrong. 
so there's there's laws in place. Uh, but if if you you have a sinful heart that's bent on evil, that that law in itself is not going to prevent you from doing that evil. And um, you know if if sinners are transformed and are in those positions of of power and authority, um, you'll see things being changed. And I, I love what uh, uh, in in Luke chapter three uh, when the uh, uh, when the crowds were uh, coming to, uh, uh, to, to, to um, uh, John the Baptist and asking, you know, what shall, what shall we do? Uh, uh, the crowds were, were questioning him. He says, uh, uh, the man who has two tunics is to share with him who has none. He who has food is to do likewise. Some tax collectors also came to be baptized. They said to him, teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, collect no more than what you've been ordered to. to. Some soldiers were questioning him and uh, saying, and what about us? What shall we do? And he said to them, do not take money from anyone by force or accuse anyone falsely and be content with your wages. He didn't say, uh, what, you're, you're collecting taxes? Get out of that tax business. You're, you're a soldier. Stop being a, a, a soldier. You know, uh, um, uh, you, you, uh, you're, you're in the society. You know, you just need to, to free yourself from this. That's not what he said. He said, you're in that society. You're in that position of power. Do what's right. You're a tax collector. I'm not telling you to stop taking taxes. Only collect what you're supposed to take. You're a soldier. Uh, you, you have a position of authority. You know, don't take anything by by force. You know, to, to be just in whatever area of life you find yourself, that as Christians whose hearts have been changed, whose people who have truly repented, and they're in those positions, they will start to act rightly and justly. Uh, so, so Christians should not be about the overthrow of any kind of government. That that is not a Christian position. Uh, Christians should be about being the salt and light. You know, within their societies. And seeing people change from the inside out, not from the outside in. So, uh, so, so government is a good thing. It's been established by God. It's ordained by God. And we're to submit to government for the Lord's sake, not to seek to, to overthrow and overturn, uh, but to submit and to see what we can do to, to affect, you know, change, again, from the inside out, putting good people in, in place, you know, uh, supporting the government, submitting to the, to the government. Um, so that, that's, as, as Christians, what we're to, what we're to do. And always remembering that when we talk about justice, I think you might've mentioned this in our last discussion, George, that, you know, m my sense of justice uh, is, might be flawed. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 48, that we're to be as perfect as God is perfect. Mm -hmm. And so while it might be legitimate to be sorrowful about, uh, it is legitimate to be sorrowful about injustices that are happening outside of us, that we also have to remember that we're all going to stand before God and all of us have fallen short of that standard of perfection because Jesus is talking about both external and internal, even my motivations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And thankfully, though there's no salvation in BLM, there is with the true God. Amen. That the Lord Jesus Amen. has stood in our place as the propitiation for our sins, rose victoriously that all who repent, put faith in him, will be saved, will be made just, declared just, by the true justifier, mm -hmm. the glory of God by his grace. Gentlemen, one last brief okay. question, and then uh, we'll close here. So is it racist for uh, a, a person with less melanin to not ascribe to BLM and to, to not bow the knee in the solidarity that's happening right now? And is it racist to not to, to believe you know i don't i don't really have to ap apologize for the the wicked uh ills that were done in, in years past in our nation is that racist to feel like i don't need to apologize for that yeah uh, so ab absolutely absolutely not and um you know it's you know every every man uh has to answer for his own sins you know um uh, 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 not the, the sins of his, his ancestors. It's not, you know, we're not to repeat that that proverb that, you know, my fathers have uh, e eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. And, you know, I'm suffering for the, the sins of the forefathers and I must, you know, somehow apologize for the sins that, that I didn't commit, which is even, you know, when I when we talk about this idea of racial reconciliation, it's a, it's a misnomer because you reconcile with people that you've actually sinned against. You know, so if somebody comes to me and say, you know, please forgive me, I'm going to ask, well, what, what, what was the wrong that you committed? You know, well, well I didn't commit the wrong, but I, I know my ancestors or I'm part of a group that's, that's uh, historically treated people that look like you, you know, poorly. Like, what is that about? 
like like it, it and I think it really makes a it makes a mockery of forgiveness. It makes a mockery of forgiveness. Hmm. Like you, you haven't actually sinned, but now like you know somehow you know because you know I look like somebody that you might have sinned against. Now you got to come and apologize to me. Like like what is that? And, and and the reconciliation like the and here here is the tragedy, guys. Here is this is this is what breaks my heart over this. Okay, and I, I hope you're listening. Like what breaks my heart over this is there are believers who are already reconciled. You have already been reconciled by the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has died to atone for your sins. Your sins have been forgiven. He's made the two groups, you know, we talked about that in Ephesians 2, has broken down the, 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 the wall of partition, the barrier. He's broken down the wall and made the two groups into one. Like that is the work of Jesus Christ. The powerful work of Jesus Christ has already been done to reconcile you to one another. Hmm. And now you're going to look at, you're going to look at that work that's already been done in the church. I'm talking to the church now. Okay. You're going to look at that work that's already been done to reconcile you together. And you're going to say, that's not sufficient. Hmm. When Jesus Christ died, he said, it's done. It's complete. It's finished. Like the work that needed to be done to reconcile you to God and to reconcile you to one another has been accomplished in the cross. And now you're going to come down later on the line and say, you know what? That work wasn't enough. Like, like I need you to bow down here and, and wash my feet and uh, tell me what your ancestors did. It, 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 it mocks the cross, okay? Yeah. It mocks the cross. Yeah. You're saying that, that the blood of Christ is not sufficient to bring unity within the church. Now we need Black Lives Matter to bring unity to the church. Like, like you need to think about like the, what are you hitching yourself to when you, when you, when you hitch your, 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 your caboose onto that train, where are you going? What are you saying? Who are you aligning yourself with? What are you saying about the cross? You're, you're, you're telling me that the cross is not enough to bring reconciliation, but you bowing down and washing my feet. Well, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's tough to, to, to watch what's going on. Like I said, especially within the church. Yep. Now people talk about these things, uh, you know, not to sign up with Black Lives Matter movement, uh, not to uh, to join in a march, you know, uh, not to apologize for your racist ancestors has nothing to do with the unity that we should have as believers. Absolutely zero yeah. to do with that. We're already reconciled and we, we need to we need to, to accept and celebrate the finished work of the cross. That's as believers. That's what we need to do. Celebrate the finished work of the cross. And at the same time, to say what you just said, George, which is absolutely right, to say what you said uh, requires a different degree of boldness from somebody who's not black, mm -hmm. right? That to actually say everything that is true that you said, but not share our skin color requires a different degree of boldness. And I would say any Christian, who is saying exactly what you just said, has the authority to say that, not based on their experience, not based on uh, instances of being the victim of oppression, not based on their skin color or anything else except God's word. This is what God has said, and any Christian should, should actually not only feel free, but have the boldness to say this is what God's word said, and I'm not going to bow down to any other authority who said who says it otherwise. If God has spoken in wisdom clearly as He has in the scriptures, then we can take that and we can stand on that, regardless who opposes us or regardless of of what opposition might come. That's that's been my prayer for our church that Amen. we would all agree on these issues from the scriptures and be bold about it and not be apologetic about agreeing with God. Those who disagree with what you just said disagree with God. And so it's not an issue of who I am or what experiences I've had. Um, Christians need to, need to be courageous in, in saying that. And you know what? To God be the glory for, for the opposition that may come because of that. Amen. And I'll, I'll just say one more thing. Um, I don't want anybody to hear me say that, that we shouldn't be sympathetic to one another and what their experiences have been. Sure. And uh, I, I really, I, I do appreciate what what Shailen wrote on the uh, on a, a blog, a Gospel Coalition blog, and you know, just kind of shared his heart and you know how he feels over these issues, and and I, I appreciate that, and I, I want to 
say that as, as believers, those who love one another, that if, if something happens in society and, and that reminds me of something that was very, very painful in my past. So let's say somebody was, was abused. They come from a, an, an abusive background, you know, where I've been habitually, you know, abused over a long period of time. And now something else happens that reminds me of my own personal history. Uh, for you to come and say, hey, what, what, are you, what are you bothered about? You know, like, just get over it. Like, that's, that's not loving. You know, so, so as believers, we need to come alongside of other believers and say, you know what, I want to I hear you. You know, I, I, I have an experience what you've experienced, but, you know, I, I, I love you. I care about you. I'm concerned about you. You know, what can I, what can I do to, to help? What can I do to understand? You know, what can I do to sympathize and, 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 and love you and, and comfort you, bring you, the, bring you comfort? Yeah. You know, so as believers, we need to do that. I've experienced, you know, things in my past as well. I don't always talk about them. But, but, but yes, we need to, 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 to come alongside other believers when they're saying they're hurting to say, yes, I love you. I want to come alongside of you. I want to understand you. So as believers, we need to do that. But, but, but again, when we're talking about reconciliation and the unity that we should have, I, I'm not reconciled over a shared experience. I'm not reconciled over, you know, a shared history. You know, I'm not even reconciled with you because I, I, I know all about your background or your history. That's, that's not what brings the reconciliation. The reconciliation happens because of, of Christ. And because I'm reconciled to you and because I'm one with you, I, I do want to understand. I do want to love. I do want to care. So, so we, we need to speak out of, out, again, out of truth. <laughs> out of, out of um, you know, what we know to be true in scripture. And, uh, and regardless of if you share the same experience, you know, so some people can immediately connect with one another because you know what, I had that same experience as you had. And people just immediately bond together over that experience. What we really need to work towards, especially as the people of God and, and, and show the world, is that it doesn't matter if I've shared your same experience. I, I, I'm connected to you. I'm part of the same body. And when you hurt, I hurt. You know, you don't hit your finger and say, oh, it's only my finger that's hurting. You know, no, that's that's me that's hurting. Right. Because <laughs> because I'm connected to my finger. You know, that finger, that finger belongs to me. Like we're, we're, we're I'm all hurting right now. You know, I just say I'm hurting. I don't just say, oh, it's just my finger. I'm I'm in pain. You know, and one of our if one of our members is in pain, it's like we want to come alongside that member to say that, you know what, I, I want to understand you. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm hurt with you, you know, and uh, and to bring them to a place of, of healing and and not just dismiss what their past has been, but we need to go beyond just, you know, shared history, shared experience to say, you know what, we share the same savior. You know, we're part of the same body. And, uh, and, and, and th that overrides, you know, whatever other kind of connection we might have. Like we, we, we share the same unity in Jesus Christ. We're all part of the same family. So, uh, so yeah, if, if I'm a father and I have, you know, one child from, from Taiwan and another child from Russia and another child from Ethiopia and another child from Brazil, and I put them all together in the same household. It's like, you know what? You're, you're all family now because because you've all been adopted by the same father. You're all family. Amen. So how are you to treat one another? You know, that's your brother. That's Amen. your sister. I don't care if you don't look alike. You're connected now. You've all been adopted by the same father. You all share the same last night, same last name. In the body of Christ, we are we, we have all been adopted by our God and father. We, we, we all share the, a similar identity. We're, we're all we all share the same name, the name of Christ. Right. You know, so, so we're together in this. We're family now in a way that the world shouldn't be able to understand. So we, we have something to show the world that the, the, the world hasn't seen, doesn't know about, can't experience outside of the bond of Jesus Christ. So I would just plead with the church to be the church, to love one another, to, to seek to understand one another, and don't let go of the truths of Scripture that we all hold to. Don't seek another reconciliation outside of the reconciliation that's provided for us in Jesus Christ. Thank you, George. That's a uh, great benediction. And uh, we, will, we will end it there. Thank you very much, Omri. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen, for your wisdom. Uh, greatly appreciate you, brothers, for your, the way you balance truth and love from the scriptures in this issue is, is, is a great example for all of us. Greatly appreciate it. Omri, would you close us in prayer, brother? Would love to, man. Yeah. God, you know all things. You've uh, ordained everything that comes to pass, all for your glory and from a wisdom that we could not possibly uh, understand or comprehend. 
God, I pray for the uh, three churches represented in this meeting, that you would strengthen our churches to hold tight the truth. Pray for uh, the churches in America just struggling to wrestle with these issues, God. I pray that you would exalt your name with your word uh, in these times and that your people would be courageous to love, to demonstrate uh, compassion and mercy and uh, a right justice uh, toward those that we have the opportunity to display these virtues toward. And God, may your son be exalted, your gospel be made known, and your church be purified through these trying times. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. 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 George Henry, thank you so much for your time. Greatly appreciate it. You're welcome. Yeah, God bless you, brother. Thanks, Eric.